since 941, as always. Uh, this class is without beginning of days or end of years. Its course is one eternal round. Um, all right. I feel like I kind of got a little bit ahead of myself last time when talking about carbocations because we sort of jumped in for the cyclopentyl, uh, cyclopropyl carbinyl carbocation, which is a pretty complicated example. Um, and so I thought we'd back up and go simple and then build up to complex. This should be our last lecture on chapter one. Uh, I will, I posted the rubric for your exam that I showed you last time. Tomorrow I will send you out the questions for exam one. Uh, and then on, you will schedule a time with me. Uh, stay tuned for an email about how to do that sometime on Thursday when you will present to me a couple of your answers to those exam questions. One that you pick, one that I pick. I'll grade your answers according to the rubric, and then I've also made arrangements for you to submit your written answers if you want me to consider those too. So um, the exam will be worth 200 points overall like it would have been had it just been a completely written exam. Um, but yeah, I think that's all I want to say about that now. Next time we will move on to chapter two. However, only chapters 14 and one will be on uh, this exam. Yeah. Is there going to be some like control for which questions you ask to all of us? Will there be some control as to which question I ask to all of you? No. Okay. I will do whatever I want. Okay. It, they, they, I'm not going to obviously give some person an easy question versus a, another person a hard question. And um, if there are some easy questions versus hard questions, then you'll choose the easy one for you and then I'll pick the hard one. I, I, it, it will be fair. Okay. Uh, I do that because I don't want you to go out, the first person to go out and say, he, he chose question three or for question 47. There's not going to be 47 questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do I see another hand, Jared? Yeah, so will you be choosing your question like one week in advance? Yeah, you won't know, but you can bring your written written answers and use them as as notes um, I will however want to see that you understand it more than just um, reading it from the notes like Russell in the movie Up my name is Russell and I am a wilderness explorer scout do you anyway so you will need to you will need to show that you understand it more than just uh, reading an answer but I use notes, you should be able to use notes, and this mask is driving me nuts, I'm sorry. <sighs> okay, other questions? It's got TIE Fighters and the Millennium Falcon on it though, so it's pretty cool. Um, yesterday uh, was Grammy Sunday, we took all the kids over to my mom and dad's house for dinner, my mom, I have got 90, one-year-old grandparents that are still kicking it and doing well, but um, and they come over for Grammy Sunday as well, but we don't want to infect them, and so we started all wearing masks, but I decided to go full on, so I showed up with my mask on and my Darth Vader helmet on. Um, it, was, it wasn't supposed to be political commentary. I was just going for a laugh. Unfortunately, my little niece, who's four, that would have got the biggest kick out of that, um, was not there because she had a runny nose. And my kids are no longer impressed with my Darth Vader mask. They're like, yeah, yeah, whatever. So, okay, carbocations. Our, uh, we can look at carbocations from both valence bond theory and MO theory perspectives, and they're going to give us the same sort of answer. Um, we've already really dealt with the... Uh, planar methyl carbocation using our qualitative MO theory approach. Recall that um, planar methyl, the orbitals looked something like this. This was the lowest energy sigma orbital with 1s and uh, contributors from the hydrogen and 2s uh, contributor from the carbon. Then we had two degenerate pi CH3 type orbitals. Um, one of them in which 
oops, that's ugly. Maybe I need to choose a different color there. One in which you have uh, a P orbital oriented in this direction so that one lobe can overlap with that S orbital on hydrogen, whereas the lower lobe can overlap with the two uh, 1S orbitals on the hydrogen at the bottom. Alternatively, we can draw the orbital where you have the P orbital coming out at us and back into the page. I'm forgetting what we said the X, Y, and Z axes were, so that's why I'm forced to use this direction versus that direction. This is reminding me of a conversation I had with my oldest son yesterday while driving in the car about what the difference between length, height, and width was and whether it mattered. And he was arguing that, that uh, if someone is six feet tall, you can call them six feet high, but not six feet long. And I told him I wasn't sure whether it even mattered. Um, but anyway. And then uh, for the carbocation, we have the highest energy empty orbital, which is, of course, the P orbital. I think we call this the 2PZ orbital. And we had discussed how being planar allows the electrons uh, in the pi allows these uh, two sets of pi orbitals to be equal in energy so that the electrons that populate them can be lower than they would if this was uh, pyramidal. All right. Valence bond theory will give us basically the same answer. For valence bond theory, we'd say, okay, there's three groups surrounding CH3. It's going to be trigonal planar, and uh, each of those bonds is formed from an sp3 hybridized orbital on carbon. Uh, and therefore what's left is an unhybridized p orbital and that's the LUMO. So we come up with basically the same answer from valence bond theory and qualitative uh, molecular orbital theory. Now when we start making the molecule more complicated then uh, we will still end up with the same answer uh, but we'll go about it conceptually in a few different ways. So I want to talk about ethyl cation, uh, the primary cation that you were told that you thought based on stuff in 351 doesn't exist. It turns out it's not a good intermediate in uh, aqueous solution, but it's a fine thing to draw in the gas phase. All right, ethyl cation. Our qualitative molecular orbital theory approach is going to be to build ethyl cation from pyramidal CH2 or CH3 and then bent CH2. And then we're going to fill them up with the available electrons. All right? Uh, sure. So, reminding ourselves what our orbital alphabets are. Uh, for pyramidal CH3, we'll draw the sigma out orbital, which is going to be our highest energy one. And uh, da -da -da. we know what the sigma out orbital looks like. <laughs> Then a little bit lower than that, we've got the two degenerate pi CH3 type orbitals. Um, sorry, hurry in a little bit. And then at the bottom, we'll have our um, sigma <clears throat> CH3 orbital that's made entirely of the 2s orbitals from uh, the 2s orbital on carbon and the 1s orbitals on 
the hydrogens. So this is where I wish we could copy and paste, but whatever. All right, so those are our alphabet of pyramidal methyl orbitals. And I'm not sure if I've got the energy spacing OK there. Um, let's now do bent CH2, which we've done before. Um, bent CH2 should have a similar energy orbital that looks like this. We're going to draw the bend uh, coming with the proton coming out at us and then going back into the page because uh, we're going to want to arrange this molecule in this way so that, yeah. I am so sorry. There we go. We're going to arrange this um, orbital uh, with the bent with the bend of our CH2 group sort of in the X uh, sort of in the plane going back into the board and out of the board so that later on the pi orbitals can overlap. All right. Uh, the other orbitals we have for bent CH2 include um, just one pi orbital, and that will look like this. So it's going to be the one that has the p orbital coming out of the page at you and then going back into the page. And each lobe of that p orbital will overlap in phase with one of the two hydrogens of our bent CH2. Um, then we will also have a sigma out from our bent CH2. And, and we can imagine it being roughly the same in energy as our sigma out from the pyramidal methyl. And then finally, what we would have on bent CH2 that we've not yet accounted for uh, is the empty p orbital. Okay, Notice that uh, these molecules each have the same number of MOs that we're bringing to the table. The difference is that with bent CH2, one of your group orbitals is basically a non-bonding atomic orbital. Oops. OK. So we have sigma pi, sigma out, and p. So now we get to combine these in in-phase and out-of-phase combinations to see what we get. And some of the answers we get are going to be insightful in terms of telling us where exactly the LUMO of the molecule is. So we'll focus in on some of those combinations. Um, I, I won't draw for you now because I think it would be straightforward for you to construct them what the plus and minus sigma combinations are going to look like. You simply have to bring the two orbitals together in phase and out of phase. So if it's all right with you, I will simply indicate that they are here and move on. And we actually, I'm sorry, will not fill these with electrons until the very end. Okay, All you'd need to do for the out of phase combination is just bring them together and make one of them yellow instead of pink. Is that okay if I don't draw those? They're in my notes if you want to see them later. But um, All right, the next is going to be combining uh, our, one of our two pi orbitals 
with a corresponding pi orbital from the CH2 group. And if you were to pick which one you should use, you'd probably pick the one that has the similar symmetry, right? The way we've arranged this bent CH2, the p orbital on carbon is coming out of the page and back into the page. Similarly, it's this pi CH3 on the right that resembles that. So you've got, <clears throat> I'm sorry, some side to side uh, pi overlap there. We'll call this pi plus pi. And um, you could envision that one simply by, whoa, dropping stuff, uh, lining up those two contributors together side by side in phase. And then at some distance up here, you would have the out of phase combination. Again, if it's all right, I'm not gonna draw that because I think it's probably pretty straightforward for you to get, okay? All right, well, what are we going to do with the other pi orbital? And that's an interesting question because you got two choices on the CH2 group. I'm, I'm asking, what are we going to do with this pi orbital? It doesn't look like it would be a good idea to mix it with this sigma out because the symmetries don't match. If you try to bring this lobe close to this part, you've got similar overlap on either side, no favorable bonding interaction. So we're going to want to combine, in, in general, if we can, we're going to want to mix orbitals that are closer in energy, but only if the symmetry allows it, okay? So it turns out the best that we can do for this pi CH3 is to mix with the only remaining orbital that has pi type character, and that's our p orbital. Now these two are fairly far apart in energy. So we're gonna apply one of the rules we learned from QMOT, which is that uh, when orbitals are far apart in energy, they don't mix as much. The stabilization of the lower energy orbital, of the bonding orbital is not that great. So it goes down a little bit. Maybe we'd put it here. And this is going to be the pi plus P combination. And then we're, and I guess we need the dotted line going, yikes. That was not even kind of a line, it was more of a squiggle. And then the higher energy out of phase combination here is only gonna be a little bit higher than our uh, p orbital. So this is pi minus p. Now this one we want to draw. And we're going to draw it right here. Okay. Um, so I'm going to draw just the skeleton of the molecule. And then we're going to draw this orbital. Now they're the p orbital and the pi CH3 that we are mixing together are different in energy. So which of the two, CH3 or CH2, should have more of this new molecular orbital? CH3 because it's closer in energy, right? When two orbitals are far apart in energy, they mix together such that the bonding orbital is more on the lower energy at uh, section and the antibonding orbital is more on the higher energy section. So we might draw uh, this orbital in the following way. Maybe we'd have sort of a large coefficient on this CH2 or CH3, sorry, the pyramidal methyl. And then we'd have a smaller coefficient on the bent CH2 group. And if we were to sort of draw what this orbital looked like, we would know that we, would, we have a plane, uh, a node plane in the 
uh, along that line. And then above the plane, we have a lot of orbital here, tapering down to just a little bit of an orbital there. And then a lot of orbital here, tapering down to just a little bit there. So that's fascinating to me because if you take a step back and look at that, sorry, I needed a larger crayon. Take a step back and look at it. It looks not that different from a pi bond, right? It looks kind of like a distorted pi bond that's mostly on the CH3 and then tapers down to being a little bit on the carbon, okay? Um, then let's go up. Actually, um, we're going to see <clears throat> that this orbital, orbital is one of the two that corresponds to our valence bond concept of hyperconjugation. Remember that hyperconjugation describes an empty orbital being partially filled uh, by a filled orbital in the molecule. We might have expected in a carbocation to have sigma 2p hyperconjugation where electrons from a neighboring CH bond delocalize partially into the empty p orbital. We're going to see uh, as we go through this um, analysis that this pi plus p orbital is going to be filled and it will suggest that electrons that are somewhat CH bonding are delocalized and are now somewhat CC bonding. In other words, you've sort of got partial double bond character. When we draw the valence bond picture of hyperconjugation in a minute, you're going to see how this uh, corresponds exactly to our MO picture. Uh, questions about how we generated that? <clears throat> Okay, I can't tell if I'm talking super loud or not because of this dang mask. It's annoying. I went on Friday to Chick-fil-A with Amber to get lunch and the guy behind the counter had a mask, I had a mask, and there was a plexiglass shield in between us. And he said, and I said, I would like the chicken salad and, or the Cobb salad. And he said, what? And I said, what? And I had to lean my head around the... <laughs> the stupid barrier to be able to hear the guy. So I'm trying to speak loudly. If it's too loud, I apologize. Um, the next one is easy. This is the simple combination of sigma out orbitals. You've got end on end overlap. And I believe uh, based on your book's arguments, uh, I believe the relative position of this orbital is here just a little bit above the pi plus p. I'm not going to draw that orbital because it is easy to draw. It's just end-on-end -end overlap of those two. Roughly corresponding to a carbon-carbon bond. <clears throat> uh, one thing we also need to take care of is the antibonding combination pi minus pi, which, oh no, we did that already. Sorry, that's already there. Okay, checking that out. And then finally, we need to draw the pi minus p. Uh, this is the combination of this pi methyl group uh, orbital with this p orbital. They are far apart in energy. The new orbital we draw should therefore be mostly on the bent CH2 group with a little bit with a little bit on the neighboring uh, pyramidal CH3. So we might draw that this way, large uh, orbital coefficient on the CH2 group, <clears throat> smaller orbital coefficient 
Oops, I don't know what I'm doing here. on the uh, CH3 group with a node in between the two. And um, now having drawn, questions about how we got that one? Having drawn all of these orbitals, we can now fill them up with the available electrons. We have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. Six electron pairs, so that means we're going to fill the uh, lower sigma orbitals. We're going to fill the pi plus pi, the pi plus p, the sigma out plus sigma out, and then the pi minus pi. And we're going to see that the LUMO of our molecule is this pi minus p combination, which uh, qualitative molecular orbital theory tells us LUMO is mostly on CH2, but also on the neighboring alpha protons. I guess we could call this the alpha carbon relative to the positively charged carbon. This is also a consequence of valence bond theory and hyperconjugation. All right? So what we wanted to show you is that qualitative MO theory tells you that Electrons that you thought were mostly CH uh, bonding are also CC bonding because they mix with the P orbital on the CH2 group. And then that the LUMO, which we normally would have thought was just the empty P orbital on the, car on the positively charged carbon, is actually also delocalized on the neighboring carbon. Go ahead, Austin. So in, the, in these That's a great question, and uh, I, the answer is I don't know. Um, what would you predict? Um, I might be inclined to say that a positively charged carbon is more electronegative than a not positively charged carbon, and therefore that those orbitals should maybe be lower in energy, but, uh, but I don't know. Yeah? Yes, yeah, because that's a direct out of phase end on end overlap. So that's going to be a really high energy antibonding orbital. Yeah, you're right to think about it. We just didn't draw it here because it's not the lowest energy one. And, you, and your text does this generally with these group orbital mixings. Once you get to the LUMO, your text is like, eh, whatever. And I've done some calculations in Gaussian. And frankly, once you get past the LUMO or maybe the LUMO, the, the one above the LUMO, they start to look kind of strange and... I just sort of give up at that point. Um, yeah. All right, others, yeah. Um, so if we were drawing acetic acid, would we take this structure and add an oxygen? If we were drawing acetic acid, would we take this structure and add an oxygen? Uh, I think if you added an oxygen on that positively charged carbon, you'd have ethanol. Yeah. So I think you could make ethanol that way. Um, but if we were to do acetic acid, what I would imagine doing is something like combining the group orbitals for CH3 with group orbitals for, say, a carboxylic acid. And in one of those mixtures, you would be taking this pi CH3 and mixing it probably with the pi type orbitals of the carboxylate. And that would account for what we typically call sigma to pi star hyperconjugation. And that would tell you that some of the electrons that would be in this pi type orbital would actually be delocalized out onto the carbon and the oxygens of the carboxylic acid. And then some of the LUMO, the pi star, would actually be, or some of the pi star, whatever it is, would be delocalized onto these CH bonds. Yeah. Um, yeah, but if you wanted to make, say, acid aldehyde, yeah, you would combine pyramidal methyl with the orbitals we made for formaldehyde. Okay. Um, 
our valence bond picture of carbocations. Uh, I typically have drawn this in previous uh, sophomore organic classes when talking about carbocations. We use this to explain why more substituted carbocations are more stable. And I draw the empty p orbital on the positively charged carbon. And then I draw one of the neighboring uh, carbon hydrogen sigma bonds. And uh, for some reason, I draw them together in phase because I think people are more comfortable with that. Then often I draw a pair of electrons in there and I say, you can get partial delocalization of those electrons into the p orbital. Uh, I call this sigma to p hyperconjugation. And uh, I say that the consequences are that you would expect from this that the CH sigma bond is longer and weaker because the electrons are spread out and are not only between the carbon and hydrogen bond. Uh, you can you would also make a prediction that the CCH, uh, the alpha proton bond angle, uh, gets closer to 90 degrees so that that proton can overlap more effectively with the neighboring p orbital. <clears throat> and the other consequence is that the LUMO uh, on, on, uh, in the, on the, pot, the p orbital on the positively charged carbon spreads out onto the alpha proton. That's what I would have said. Um, technically, hyperconjugation can be represented without any orbitals at all simply by doing what's called a no-bond resonance structure. Um, it may make you uncomfortable, and that's fine if it does. A no bond resonance structure is to take the electrons that are in this uh, carbon hydrogen bond and move them down to form a sort of pseudo pi bond between the two carbons, keep the proton in the same place, and have it be positively charged. Okay? Such that a hybrid structure would look like this, which basically tells you the same thing that hyperconjugation tells you. The positive charge is delocalized on the carbon and on the hydrogen, and there's partial double bond character. Okay, Those are the exact same conclusions we would have made from our QMOT approach. The uh, electrophilicity of that alpha proton we get in QMOT from the, from the LUMO, the fact that some of it's on the alpha protons, and then the partial double bond character and perhaps weaker carbon-hydrogen bond we get from the fact that this orbital, which normally would have just been here between carbons and hydrogens, is now partially delocalized to the neighboring carbon. Right? Okay, we beat that one dead. Or is it on life support if it's not completely dead yet? I don't know, that's kind of macabre. It is, it is getting close to Halloween, but I probably should stop using death metaphors. Um, my kids are weird. On the way to my mom's house yesterday, um, we were suddenly trying to think of uh, ways to spruce up October to, be, to promote various products. We thought of Porktober. Uh, to promote pork. Socktober, maybe a month where you wear interesting socks. Um, Nathan's favorite was Glocktober, a promotion of handguns, <laughs> which is kind of silly. Um, I'm trying to remember my favorite. Spocktober, um, celebration of Star Trek, and so on. Uh, okay, we thought we were done with carbocations, but it looks, but it, it actually, the picture is more complicated. Um, because carbocations are known to rearrange. 
uh oh. And and this is the point at which my sophomore organic students would start groaning because we had lived all along pretending that carbocation rearrangements didn't occur, and then we mentioned them, and then you had to worry about them. Um, ethyl cation is known to rearrange. You could do this experiment by um, labeling one of the carbons or perhaps putting labeling some uh, of the hydrogens using deuterium or, and so on. We'll call this structure one. And it's known that the hydrogen can lean over <clears throat> and equilibrate with structure two. This is not a resonance structure. This involves movement of atoms, uh, movement of nuclei. We used to have a carbon-hydrogen bond on carbon one. Now we have it on carbon two. <clears throat> These are known to be in equilibrium. And an interesting question to ask is to imagine what this reaction would sort of, what this molecule would look like sort of halfway through. You might imagine an intermediate structure in which the hydrogen carbon, the bond between the hydrogen that's moving and carbon one is partially broken whereas the bond that is going to form between the hydrogen and carbon-2 is partially formed. And we don't exactly know where to put the positive charge. It is probably somewhere uh, involved somewhere on either carbon-1 or carbon-2 or perhaps the proton. And we don't exactly know where to put the two electrons that we had originally said we're in this carbon-hydrogen bond. Are they on carbon-1? Are they on carbon-2? Or are they everywhere? Um, some people might view this as a transition state. Alternatively, you could hypothesize that it is actually an intermediate that has and we wouldn't need to resort to this in, uh, MO, uh, in an MO picture. But in valence bond theory, we would have to say that this is a three center but two electron bond. And we would sort of call uh, the proton here hypervalent. So we're not sure whether it's a transition state or an intermediate. Uh, but carbocations that have hypervalent atoms are sometimes called carbonium ions. Normally, if it's just uh, a classical carbocation with everything uh, a, with a trivalent carbon that's positively charged, we would call that a carbenium ion. But the question is, is this? Um, carbonium species, a transition state, or an intermediate. Uh, that's hard to get at. <laughs> uh, and the issues are kind of subtle. Uh, as an example, we've already shown you what um, the LUMO of the localized carbocation should look like. Uh, we won't go through the calculation or the process of drawing the orbitals for uh, the carbonium intermediate with the hypervalent hydrogen, it's pretty easy. You just take basically ethylene and then you add a proton right in the middle of it and mix the orbitals. Uh, but what you come up with for, um, let's see, I'll copy our two orbitals that look like they're involved in hyperconjugation. And this is. Uh, we'll remember, our, the, remember that this is the, what we get from the carbonium species. If we alter that to the carbonium species, it actually is a really subtle difference. Bloop. Um, we simply overlap the hydrogen Oops, struggling to color again. 
uh, with the uh, like phased orbitals on the same side of the molecule stay the same down here. And, and what you get if you take a step back and just look at what the calculation tells you is something that basically looks like a pi bond. So, I mean, that is literally what you would get if you took the hydrogen here and started to slide it over and allowed this carbon to rehybridize, bringing these protons up to and sort of in to the node. All right. And um, the LUMO is even more boring because it looks just like the pi star. Ooh, wow, that was bizarre. What did we do there? It looks just like a pi star. I don't like that color gray. Why don't I like that color gray? I would want to erase. There we go, erase. Looks just like the pi star, and now there can be no orbital density on that hydrogen because that hydrogen coincides with the node that is in between the two carbons. Okay, so it's just a small little movement of that proton away. In our MO picture, it's fine, right? We don't care about bonds anymore. We can just move atoms and figure out what the orbitals are. Then we fill them up with electrons. It's only really when we insist on the valence bond theory approach that we come up with this conundrum of, well, what do we do with this uh, three-centered but two electron bond. Some people call these carbonium type ions non-classical carbocations. And it's been a very contentious issue in physical organic chemistry as to whether these are transition states or intermediates. Calculations tell you though that at least for the ethyl uh, cation, this is actually the more stable intermediate. Okay, but that won't be universally true. With T-butyl cation, which can also rearrange, the uh, carbonium ion is the, I'm sorry, the carbonium ion with the positive charge on the more substituted carbon is the intermediate. And this is what I was trying to communicate last time when I said, do we go from um, carbonium to carbonium through a bridged carbonium transition state or is there a possibility that there is a higher energy intermediate that is the carbonium ion or is it possible that actually you have a lower energy intermediate that is the carbonium ion or is it possible that the carbonium ions are, are also actually not intermediates and all you have is the carbonium ion. Lots of different possibilities. No general principles to get from here other than that carbocation potential energy surfaces are relatively flat. The differences in energy between intermediate and transition state are small. That's why carbocation rearrangements can happen. And you just have to be aware that these might be possibilities. And there are times in chemistry when you need to use such carbocations as explanations for things. Um, so I want to show you a couple examples from terpene chemistry um, about where these things might occur. All right. So um, terpenes are natural products derived from isoprene subunits. Here is one of those. This is the um, alpha terpinyl carbocation. And uh, it's fairly quick for the pi bond to attack the positive charge there to generate the following intermediate. And this structure is going to look weird. And that's fine. It should. <laughs> you got a six-membered ring and a strained four-membered ring in the same molecule. If we were to flip this over, maybe it would be easier for us to draw, but not easier for me to think about suddenly. Where does the flip 
and this would be, oops, dang it, I don't like that. Okay, and since sometimes we like to draw these things to, uh, to the side to get a sense for what they actually look like, hmm. Let's draw our positively charged carbon there. Then here is our weird four-membered ring. Okay. So just to orient you, here is the four-membered ring. And then here is the six-membered ring. With me so far? Okay. Um, and you can form products from that intermediate. However, there are other products that you can't get um, without doing a rearrangement. For example, you can convert what I've shown you here into the following product, which looks bizarre, right? Because we still have a six-membered ring, but our four-membered ring is gone. And it looks like what used to be our, whoops, it looks like what used to be our four-membered ring it used to be that this was connected here and now it's connected there. So the question is, how on earth did that happen? Um, and you can do this from a valence bond approach or you could calculate the orbitals. Uh, let's just, because it's easier to talk through it from a valence bond sort of approach, let's imagine you've got, um, sorry, and the unhybridized p orbital associated with that um, whoa where did that go hold, hold on that positively charged carbon and then you also have this adjacent carbon carbon bond that can overlap with it in phase in fact if you were to make the structure you would see that it's almost like you've got a pi bond there, okay? So it's easy for these electrons to shift over and to form a new intermediate, which we're gonna just draw um, in the same sort of arrangement. Okay, let me show you all the atoms. Uh, these four atoms used to be part of our six-membered ring, or our four-membered ring, and these six atoms used to be part of our six-membered ring but we've moved a bond here, and now the positive charge is there. Now, the question has been, I guess, let me just pause and ask, do you accept that that's even possible? If this bond can, if, uh, sorry, this carbon-carbon bond can line up with that empty p orbital can the electron shift over there? This is just a, you would call it a one, two alkyl shift. But the question is, is this an equilibrium or is it resonance? In other words, 
could I draw a hybrid structure based on this starting structure where I have partial bond character there, partial bond character here, um, and could I, oops, also have partial bond character there with a sort of positive charge here. And there would be ways to do double bonds as well, right? If I simply moved this pair of electrons to make a pi bond here, that would leave this with a positive charge on it, okay? Here you have, again, a three-centered but two-electron bond. And, and so the question is, is this an intermediate or is it an equilibrium? Again, people argue, but it's important to be able to pay attention to situations when this can happen. When can it happen? Same time carbocation rearrangements can happen. When you've got a positive charge with adjacent carbon-hydrogen or carbon-carbon bonds, where you can convert two different carbocations into each other. And uh, there are a lot of natural products that are available from this alpha terpinal carbocation that have to go through this kind of rearrangement or through this non-classical carbocationic intermediate, uh, including camphor, sulfonic acid, and, and others. Um, all right. I guess that's it. So be aware of those possibilities. Stay tuned for your exam tomorrow, and we'll see you then.